Guru, you are listening to Diaspora Music on Black Power 96, and we just completed the uh, Jazz Zone, and um, T and Providence did a, a, a great job, and we're getting ready to speak to uh, uh, Dr. Gerald Horn. Uh, Cornel West would say he's one of the great historians of our time, and uh, Cornel West will be on uh, a time for an awakening today at uh later on you can you can google when when it comes on elliot elliot uh booker and richard they'll be on and they'll be talking to dr horn dr pardon me dr uh cornell west and uh how are you doing uh, sir it's all good uh melinda you want to kick everything off yeah, let's. We have a big list, so uh, let's get started with uh, South African Foreign Minister Washington. Yes, Foreign Minister Pandor has been in Washington for the past few days in talks with the U.S. administration. As this audience should know by now, relations between Pretoria and Washington are rather rocky right now, not least because Pretoria dragged U.S. ally Israel into the International Criminal Court of Justice in The Hague uh, because of a plausible charge of genocide against Gazans. That was the conclusion of the ICJ. South Africa also is a member in good standing of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, which Washington feels is threatening U.S. imperialist hegemony. As a result, as we've reported, on these airwaves. Washington sought to get leverage against South Africa by improving relations with Zimbabwe, uh, loosening sanctions against the nation, although tightening them against the leadership. I don't think that that gambit is going to work. It's also sought to improve relations with Angola, <laughs> interestingly enough. And uh, interestingly enough as well is the fact that the Angolan leadership was just in China. So. Angola is sitting pretty right now, being able to maintain positive relations with the so-called two superpowers. This is all in the run-up to South African elections in the next few weeks. The ruling African National Congress is expected to lose its majority, according to polls, but we shall see. And I say that because most of the challenge is not necessarily uh, coming from an altogether progressive direction. That is an analysis based upon news accounts about their purported leading challenger from the left, speaking of the economic freedom fighters. However, the EFF takes a very hard line against immigrants, which suggests that many black people in North America who might wind up living in South Africa might become a, a target uh, of EFF. Certainly the Zimbabweans, the Mozambicans, the Congolese, the Somalis, et cetera, who have flocked to South Africa are in the crosshairs as far as the EFF is concerned. The EFF, however, has made an issue of redistributing the land, and we shall see if that takes precedence in terms of voters' eyes over their apparent hostility towards African immigrants. Then there's Jacob Zuma, the former leader of the African National Congress, former president of South Africa. Uh, he's really unveiled himself in his race for the top job again under a new guise. He's now the leader of the so-called MK party uh, taking the name of the heralded Nkunto Wesizwe, known as MK, which led the armed struggle. The, the MK veterans have challenged uh, his designation of his organization with that name. Uh, Mr. Zuma has taken positions that are perceived widely as hostile to the LBGTQ plus community. He has suggested that teenage mothers and pregnant girls be sent to Robben Island, believe it or not, where he and other ANC prisoners were once housed. Looking back retrospectively, when he replaced 
Thabo Mbeki, the second president of South Africa, after Nelson Mandela, uh, even though we know that many on this side of the Atlantic were standing and cheering when Thabo was replaced. In retrospect, uh, that was not necessarily a step forward for the nation. We knew, even as he was replacing Thabo, that uh, Mr. Zuma has multiple wives. Uh, he has children. I'm not even sure if he knows all of their names. He had been accused of raping a daughter of a comrade. So how and why the leaders of the ANC, which has an interlocking directorate with the South African Communist Party, came to see Mr. Zuma as a progressive replacement for Thabo and Becky, uh, it is a question that needs to be answered. And I think I referred a few days ago in our last conversation to how Thabo had gave this speech uh, at a university in South Africa where he made reference uh, to his replacement, although he did not go into detail. He still considers himself to be part of the ANC, although uh, Julius Malema suggests that that has not always been the case. But in any case, South African, the South African political landscape is rather muddled right now. Uh, there are, there is talk, loose talk, about South Africa unraveling as a state, believe it or not. I should also mention the parties of the ultra-right whites in South Africa, which still have traction in South Africa. I think that some of our friends on this side of the Atlantic felt that when they were defeated in 1994, that suddenly they were no longer a factor, that somehow they disappeared into the woodwork, even though they have the full-throated backing of U.S. imperialism and a good deal of the North Atlantic bloc, and their strength and potency should not be underestimated. And once again, when one does a political analysis, one has to judge the parties, not against the almighty, as is often said in the United States, the parties have to be judged as against each other. Uh, these are the parties, and which amongst these parties do you feel will move the needle in a progressive direction? And that is the dilemma that we now face in South Africa. You are listening to Diet Spork Music on Black Power 96. I wanted to ask you uh, to talk about the, the war as the war in Ukraine is uh, is it going to escalate one? And could you talk about the position that African people have taken on the war in Ukraine? in uh, North America, the Caribbean, and, and on the African continent itself? Well, the latest news, as you probably know, is this attack in Moscow by forces identified with an offshoot of the so-called Islamic State that led to dozens of Russians being slaughtered. There were oblique references by the leadership in Moscow that this may have had something to do with the war, although U.S. press accounts suggest that it has more to do with Russia's increasingly warm relations, or at least diplomatic relations, I should say more accurately, with the regime in Kabul, Afghanistan, where this offshoot of the Islamic State is jousting with the Taliban, which ousted the United States and its allies from leadership in 2021, August. And, of course, you recall that after the Soviet Union intervened in Afghanistan in 1979, December, and stayed there until 1989, U.S. imperialism helped to fund and subsidize these forces who they began to fight after the Soviet Union evacuated in 1989, that of course contributed 
to the attack on New York and Washington in September 2001, which of course led in turn to a U.S. intervention ending ignominiously in August 2021, as Afra mentioned. With regard to Ukraine, you see that there is a understanding, I think it's fair to say, amongst sovereign African nations that they should not necessarily get involved on the side of the U.S. and NATO with regard to this conflict in Ukraine. There is a further division because some nations are supportive of Russia, and that means that they echo the line that you hear in New Delhi and in Beijing and to a degree in Cuba as well that this Ukraine misadventure is designed to weaken Russia so as to make it easier to go after China. If you look at the United Nations votes, you see that initially amongst uh, the nations of Caribbean and Africa, that uh, there was a split as noted with regard uh, to whether or not they should vote against Russia on this matter. Initially, Kenya was probably the most stalwart African nation opposed to Russia. But I think that since 2022, when this special military operation was launched, and given the fact that Ukraine is losing ground and Ukraine is losing altitude, given the fact that uh, it's now been suggested that France wants to put boots on the ground in Ukraine, not least because they are upset that its former neo-colonial puppet regimes in the Sahel, speaking of Mali, Burkina Faso, Niger, have turned their backs on France and have welcomed an embrace from Russia. And that has incurred the wrath of France, perhaps leading to these inflamed remarks from President Macron of putting boots on the ground. I think that that has swayed public opinion in the Pan-African world generally. But once again, I think that Black people in North America who do not enjoy sovereignty, who oftentimes are dependent upon their analyses from biased and one-sided news items in the imperialist press, and they know that theoretically and abstractly, I'm not sure if they know that concretely, uh, should perhaps take the lead of the most advanced African nations, let's say Zimbabwe, for example, uh, when trying to come to an analysis of the situation. And speaking of that latter point, I say that in part because, as we know more than most, there has been quite a considerable discussion in the North American Pan-African community about China as the so-called new colonialists in Africa. And of course, that references and reflects the talking points of the bourgeois press in North America. And it also obscures what is really going on in Africa, because as I said before, if you're really concerned about outside influence on the African continent, you should look at the influence of the United Arab Emirates. You should look at the influence of Turkey in Somalia and in Libya and in other predominantly Muslim nations on the continent, if you're really sincere and really a free thinker and not just parroting imperialist propaganda, that should be your charge. And you're listening to Diasporic Music on Black Power 96. Before uh, uh, Melinda asked the next question, I 
I wanted to ask you, where does Ralph Gonzalez of uh, 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 St. Vincent and the Grenadines, where is he on the issue of the Ukraine? Well, I'm not really sure. Um, do you have a, a clue? Uh, no, I, I'm going to... Uh, I should have checked that out before I came on the, on, on the radio because that's I've been I've been uh, curious about about that because he is uh, he's on the left on, on most questions but I you know I I think his problem is uh like Grenada the country is so small and such a small population uh, he might he might have abstained or I don't think he would have uh, come out in support of the U S but I don't know if he would be so bold as to uh, uh, you know, uh, challenge the U.S. on that question. I'm, I'm just, that's that's just me speculating. I'll check it out and talk about it next week. F fair enough. So, Melinda, you had another question, uh, right? Yeah. Um, do we want to get into um, Gaza? Updates on Gaza? Oh, sorry. I, I was... <laughs> I, I, I was looking at another news item. Well, yes, mm -hmm. uh, the issue of Gaza arose during the rather inflamed discussions of the foreign minister of South Africa in Washington. The ICJ case, the International Court of Justice case, is still hanging fire. We talked in previous days about the blockbuster remarks of the highest ranking Jewish American elected official in the United States, Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, and his castigation of Prime Minister Netanyahu. The problem with regard to the US and Gaza and Israel right now is that credible analysts are suggesting that the entire Zionist project is unraveling, but the problem there is that as a legacy of settler colonialism in the United States of America, you have a significant representation of Zionist billionaires, such as the folks who founded Persian capital, speaking of William Ackman, the uh, Edelman family of Las Vegas, which also has interests in US professional sports, the Dallas Mavericks professional basketball team. And so they are hotly opposed to any shift in U.S. policy, despite the reputational damage that U.S. imperialism is suffering, despite the fact that instead of focusing on the rise of neo-fascism in the United States, which oftentimes continues to target uh, Jewish Americans, the Zionist lobby is targeting either A, the U.S. left, B, black American congressional representatives who do not toe the line on Israel, and C, Jewish American groups that do not toe the line on Israel, which is weakening the anti-fascist front as it purports to support Mr. Netanyahu. Uh, this is a real crisis. It's a real dilemma. And it may help to propel Mr. Trump back into the White House because Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Trump have had their contradictions and problems in the past. But now Mr. Trump's Republican Party seems to be all in with regard to Israeli massacres in Gaza. And uh, that is, of course, adding jet propulsion to Mr. Trump's effort to return to the White House. So it's a very complicated political situation here south of the border. And hopefully we will be struggling to make sure that a worst case scenario does not eventuate. You're listening to Diasport Music on Black Power 96. Uh, dealing with the Middle East, what is... Uh, there, there. Could you talk about, uh, you know, the whole the question of uh, of, uh, of of bricks and the currency? But in tie, can you tie that in with the fact that, you know, the in the Middle East, they're they're he they're, they're supporting a, a heavyweight, not a championship bout, but 
Dante Wilder and someone is fighting someplace in the Middle East. Could you put that those things together? Well, are you are they going to fight in Saudi Arabia? I say that Saudi Arabia because yes. Yes, Saudi Arabia exactly. has been uh, trying to get more involved in professional sports with regard to soccer or what's referred to globally as football, with regard to golf, with regard to tennis. And so boxing would be consistent with that. Yes. Uh, Saudi Arabia, of course, is a candidate member of the BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. The BRICS are about to launch, we are told, a digital currency, which could provide a major challenge to the hegemony of the U.S. dollar, which many have been looking forward to for decades now. We shall see if that particular currency actually materializes. Uh, you're listening to Value Sports Music along Black Power 96 with Melinda Francis, and we're in conversation with uh, Dr. Gerald Horn. Could you talk about the tensions between the U.S. and, uh, and, and Niger? Well, uh, I would refer listeners to some of our previous conversations with regard to Niger ousting U.S. troops uh, from their multi-million dollar so-called drone base in that Sahel African country, which is used to surveil Africa as far east as Somalia, if not attack Somalia itself. The Voice of America, the U.S. propaganda arm, has suggested that uh, don't think too soon that this is a done deal that the United States may be able to negotiate effectively with the authorities in Niger to make sure that base continues. But in in any case, once again, it represents a rupture with France. The United States has been upset that Niger has been trying to sell its prized uranium to Iran and raising the prices on that prized uranium to France. France is heavily dependent upon Niger for uranium to power its nuclear plants, which delivers electricity to people in the hexagonal nation we know as France. So once again, it's a reflection of the complicated politics emerging uh, out of Africa. And uh, somehow I recall this statement that used to be quite popular in our ranks, which went something like this. Uh, If you have not investigated, you should be reluctant to speak. And I think that with regard to many of our friends in the Pan-African movement in North America and some of our friends on the left as well, that prior to making pronouncements about, for example, as noted, China's role in Africa, they should apprise themselves of all of the latest news coming uh, from the continent, not least being the complicated involvements and relationships with sovereign African nations and their former colonizers, as well as sovereign African nations seeking to make their own sovereign uh, self-determined judgments about what's in their best interests. There's no investigation or right to speak. That was the Chairman Mao, but uh, is the fact that the Niger is landlocked is that is that going to, is that a a positive or a negative for the progressive forces in Niger? Is that is that is that going to be a, a fact of the fact that they are landlocked, or is the tech can technology deal with that old question of being landlocked? It's not a positive, that's for sure. Uh, in fact. Uh, Before the change in regime in Niger in July 2023, uh, there was talk about neighboring Nigeria uh, building a pipeline through Niger up north and west to Algeria and having that natural gas being pumped into Western Europe so as to blunt and countervail Western Europe's attempt to break free from Russian natural gas. Uh, Being landlocked is not a positive, as the folks in Zimbabwe 
who are similarly situated could tell you, or as the folks in Ethiopia could similarly apprise you of that reality, which has led to Ethiopia seeking an, a port uh, on the sea with Somaliland, which is a kind of breakaway from the larger Somalia, although it's more stable than the larger Somalia. Ethiopia's attempt to do so has complicated relations with the larger Somalia tremendously. As a matter of fact, uh, in recent days and weeks, we thought that it could lead to another flare-up, or dare I say, another armed conflict. So, to put it simply and bluntly, being landlocked is not a positive for Niger, technological developments and advancements set aside. Yes, sir. Melinda, you had another question. Um, so, what do we have left? What do we have left? Uh, well, let me turn to so this baseball to scandal. China, China. Oh, yeah, let's do that. We haven't done that yet. Yes. Yeah. So, as you may have heard, the most talented and perhaps in the long run, the best paid baseball player, Shohei Otani of Japan, his interpreter, who is more akin to sort of a personal assistant and what is called a body man, has been charged or has been accused of shipping money to a bookie. That is to say, the initial charge was that the interpreter was shipping Otani's money to this bookie who the interpreter had been involved with in gambling. Now, this raises a number of searching questions. Uh, there may be those in your audience who recall baseball's hit leader, Pete Rose of Cincinnati and Philadelphia, being barred from the Hall of Fame, being ousted from baseball altogether for betting on sports, not least betting on baseball. So the specter was initially and immediately raised. Can a similar accusation be made with regard to Shohei Otani, particularly since about four and a half million dollars were shipped out of accounts that carried his name to these gambling interests. The investigation is ongoing, I think, although obviously Major League Baseball is quite concerned, but none of us should be surprised. Recall my reference to gambling interests taking an ownership stake in the Dallas Mavericks basketball team. The way sports right. are now evolving Gambling interests are taking a material and concrete role in sports. This can be compromising. The coach of the Cleveland Cavaliers basketball team, in a story that should have gotten more publicity, has charged that he's gotten threatening phone calls from gamblers because people bet on the outcomes of these games. And in the past, there have been allegations that referees have been involved with gamblers. You, we know that in college sports, where until recently the players were not paid, that some of them were in bed with gamblers as well. That led to City College of New York, which once had a stellar basketball team dropping the sport altogether. So this is a very serious scandal. And the way sports is evolving is that it's feeding this gambling mania, which by the way, is just another way to loot the working class on behalf of the 1%. Because when you enter a Las Vegas casino, the house rules, those are the house rules, to put it simply. And the way things are going, you're be, gonna be able to bet electronically on just about everything. For example, Will Kevin Durant hit his next free throw? Will he hit his next three-pointer? Will uh, Shaquille O'Neal come out of retirement to join 
the Phoenix Suns. I mean, everything is up for grabs right now with this gambling. And sports better be careful because they may be in the process of killing the goose that lays the golden eggs. That is to say, I think one of the reasons why sports is so popular is because it's perceived as not being like professional wrestling, which is scripted, where the outcomes are predicted and predictable. The way sports are evolving and the way gambling interests are taking such a foothold, that helps to, in my estimation, compromise the nature of professional sports, which really could kill off this entire enterprise. Let me ask you this, Johnny Bench, uh, was it, uh, Johnny Bench was the uh, Cincinnati uh, Reds uh, uh, catcher. I guess he can't be coming, he's not in the Hall of Fame because of, he has a, some gambling uh, allegations or he was busted for cheap betting on, on, the, on his own games. Could you talk about that? You mean Pete Rose, don't you? Pete Rose, I'm sorry, Pete Rose, yeah. Yeah, I just Pete, made yeah, reference to that. And, okay. Um, th- that issue has come up again with the Otani scandal. All right. Yeah. Yeah, Pete. Yeah, uh, Pete. Yeah, uh, Pete Rose. Who, 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 who did? What? Who did Pete Rose p- play for? Cincinnati and Philadelphia. Oh, okay. That's why I mix. I'm, yeah, mix. Uh, he played with uh, uh, Cincinnati. With, I think he he was there when my f- comrade at school made Bobby Tolan was there. Uh, uh, I think they, they may have played at the same time. Is there, uh, I guess, uh, is there anything else you would like to add, but Brother Horn, because uh, we only have two minutes? Well, sadly and unfortunately, I have another uh, Zoom call to attend to, so I'm going to have to sign off. Thank you very much. And we're looking, looking forward to uh, hollering at you next week. Good luck to you. Bye-bye. And you have been listening to Dr. Gerald Horn. Uh, I'd like to thank Elisa Watson for keeping us uh, uh, sounding uh, reasonable. <laughs> All mistakes have been mine. Uh, not Melinda's and not not Lisa's. Just uh, I'll, I'll take if there were any blunders. Blame blame it on blame it on blame it on the boogie. Blame it on me. Is there anything else you'd like to add, Melinda? <laughs>